subject I am calling The Giants Keep Coming. The Giants Keep Coming. Would you bow with me as we pray? Loving Father in, in heaven, draw thou near to us because without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things through Jesus Christ. As we look into your word tonight, may you be glorified by all that is said and done because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Let everybody say amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, all of us are familiar with the story of David and uh, whom? Goliath. Whether we were raised up as kids in the Seventh-day Adventist cradle roll department, or even if we were Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians in Sunday school, every child knows about only a boy named David. Only a little sling. Only a boy named David, but he could pray and sing. Only a boy named David, only a whistling brook. Only a boy named David, but five little stones he took. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. Oh, around and around and around and around and around and around and around. And one little stone went up in the air and the giant came tumbling down. You all did good when you were in Crater Roll. Say amen for yourselves. <clears throat> now for the purposes of our message this evening, we're going to review that background story of the shepherd boy versus the giant. At that time, Saul was king of Israel, and David was caring for his father's sheep in the field. The Israelites and the Philistines were at war one with another. As the two armies lined up and squared off on the battlefield, a Philistine warrior named Goliath issued a challenge to the armies of Israel. It's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 through 11. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 through 11. I'm reading from the, King, the New King James Version, which is slightly different from the King James Version. But this is what the record says. 1 Kings 17, beginning with verse 8. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? This is Goliath talking. Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of God? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid afraid. They were fearful. Brothers and sisters, I read somewhere that we are to fear God and give glory to him, not a giant or anyone else. 
I read somewhere that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the fear of a giant or anyone else. The truth of the matter is that we have nothing to fear, except we forget how God has led us in the past and will continue to do so. Are you listening this evening? Goliath, his challenge totally demoralized the armies of Israel. For Goliath not only talked big, ladies and gentlemen, he was big. According to Holy Writ, Goliath stood about nine feet tall. Now, some of us don't even weigh, or some of us have no idea what that is. But if you were to take a fellow by the name of Shaquille O'Neal and put him beside Goliath, Shaquille would look like a toddler. Not only that, the Bible says that he had a coat of armor that weighed over 200 pounds. Some of us don't even naturally weigh 200 pounds. But that was the armor that he carried on his body weighing more than 200 pounds. And then the record said that he had a javelin. He had a javelin for a spear. And the spearhead weighed more than 25 pounds. And so for some 40 days, this behemoth strutted back and forth, back and forth in front of the soldiers of Israel, challenging them and insulting the people of God. For some 40 days, King Saul searched in vain among his troops for somebody somewhere with either the courage, the faith, or the tenacity to take on that giant. Somebody with reckless abandon who would say, I will fight you, Goliath. But there were no takers. In the meantime, David's father, Jesse, grew concerned about his three sons who were on the battlefield. So he called his youngest boy, David, from the field, and he says, I want you to go up to the army camp, and I want you to take some food to your brothers and see how things are going. When David arrived at the battle, the situation looked extremely bleak. No one seemed to know what to do, and the dark circles around Saul's eyes was an indication that here was a man who was carrying the weight of a nation on his shoulders. Even Saul's generals were divided and confused as to what to do with this giant. As the young lad observed the plight of Israel, coupled with the brashness and the arrogance of Goliath. He stepped forth to challenge him in the name of God. And brothers and sisters, I honestly believe that sometimes the Lord is looking for somebody here to stand up for him and challenge situations that are just not right. Come on. Even the king said, as everybody else was beginning to deride David and saying, you are nothing but a boy, and how can you go against this monstrosity of a being? The king himself said, you can't handle him. You are nothing but a child. But ladies and gentlemen, if you know the Lord, like David knew the Lord, you need nobody else to see you through. And I'm so grateful that David did not allow anyone, no matter what they said or what they thought, to discourage him. Sometimes 
the devil have folk out there just to discourage you from moving forward and doing what God has told you to do. And some of us give up, we put our tails between our legs, and we don't do the assignment that God has called us to do. But David took the attitude that I'm not listening to you because I serve a mighty God. And then he said to everybody, this same God, can somebody say tonight, this same God? He said, this same God who allowed me to defeat a bear and a lion as they attempted to attack my sheep. This same God. I wish somebody would say this same God again. This same God who is my rod and my staff that comforts me, this same God will give me the victory over this uncircumcised Philistine. And so using the same weapons that he brought with him, his slingshot and his faith, he went forth to meet the giants. And you know, as Paul Harvey would say, you know the rest of the story. Now, ladies and gentlemen, many folk believe that this battle with Goliath was the sum total of David's dealings with giants. But that is not the case. That was the battle with Goliath was merely David's initial fight with a giant and the most famous one. But there were other battles with giants later on. For example, if you were to look, and maybe if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21 tells us of some of these other battles that David had with other giants. If you'll start at verse 15 of 2 Samuel chapter 21, I'm going to begin reading. Once again, so that you can follow me, I will repeat the scripture. 2 Samuel chapter, one, chapter 21, beginning with verse 15. In my version, it says that when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. Then Ishbir Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zuriah, came to David's aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. At that point, David's men began to express some concern for his well-being. And they said, you shall no more go to battle with us, lest you be killed and the light of Israel be quenched. Brothers and sisters, there's a lesson here. These soldiers of David had a deep love for their leader, and they cared about his welfare. Maybe God is telling some of us that we need to be more supportive of our spiritual leaders because God has placed them in a situation where they, like David, need your prayers and your support. <clears throat> they are not angry. I mean, they are not, brothers and sisters, perfect, but they have been placed there to do a work for God, and God calls on us to support them as they follow the Lord's leading. Now, brothers and sisters, the death of 
the giant, whose name was Ishbish Benob, was not the end of the fighting with all the giants in David's life. 2 Samuel 21 also tells us about more giants. Reading from verse 18, we're still in 2 Samuel 21, reading from verse 18. Let me get it right here while you are trying to, while you're getting it there. 2 Samuel 21 and verse 18. It says, Now it happened afterwards that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sabaki, the Hushlatite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines. Well, Ahanan, the son of Jer Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Verse 20, yet again, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born of the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you are getting the picture here. What I'm saying to you is that the giants kept coming. They kept coming. But every time they came, God slew every one of them. Do you have giants in your life this evening? I want you to know that God can handle them. I don't care how big they are. I don't care what they may look like. God specializes in taking care of giants. Yes, Lord. You all are not with me this evening. Yes. This story tells us that no matter how impressive your victory may be over a giant today. There will be another one waiting for you tomorrow. Nobody goes through life facing only one giant. As a matter of fact, they will hound you to your grave. But in the words of David, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers them from them all. I wish somebody would say amen tonight. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, some giants stand as addictions. What I mean by that is that some of them are ungodly habits that we have that we just can't get the victory over. Some giants are challenges to us in school. Some giants challenge us on the job, in the home. Some giants even challenge us in the church. But whether big or small, we need God's help to deal with them. Because each of them have the potential of defeating us and wooing us away from the love of Jesus Christ. Black America knows well how the giants keep coming. This year, brothers and sisters, in 2013, we will be celebrating 150 years of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. But for over 300 years, we had to fight the giant of slavery. For over 100 years, we fought Jim Crow. We fought the giant of Southern hostility. We fought the giant of Northern backlash on one hand and benign neglect on the other hand. We fought the giant of national apathy 
and the giant of affirmative action in reverse. And we're still fighting the giant of racial discrimination as subtle as it may be. We're still fighting the giant of economic poverty, educational challenges, job opportunities, and psychological put-downs. And so for us who have gone through so much, the giants still keep coming. But nonetheless, God has brought his people a mighty long way. Oh, yes, he has. Through grace, brothers and sisters, we've come a mighty long ways. And I thank God for his grace, his marvelous grace in my life. How about you? You will discover that some of your biggest battles with giants will not be in the public arena where everybody can see and offer you support and encouragement. Some of your hardest battles, brothers and sisters, will be in your secret closet with your particular giant where nobody but you and the Lord knows what kind of battle you're going through, what kind of struggles you're having, what kind of giant you're fighting. Sometimes your greatest giants will be fought not by standing up, but by falling on your knees and asking God to keep your heart from bitterness because of the way that folk are treating you. By the way, giants are no respecter of persons. Whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, the devil has you in his sight. And don't expect giants to fight fair. They don't do it. They won't fight you when you're at your strongest they usually come in moments of physical and mental weakness. The devil came to Jesus after he had been in the wilderness for 40 days without food. And then he says to the Son of God, you don't have to do all of this. You don't have to go to a cross and endure great agony of crucifixion, all you have to do is bow down and worship me. But I am so glad that a hungry Jesus was more than a match for a full devil. Fighting giants is bad enough, but fighting them in our weakness is just overwhelming. I'm glad, brothers and sisters, that Jesus knows my weakness. What do you say? Ellen White says that, that it's in our, in our darkest moments that he is closest to us. In other words, it's when you're at your weakest point that God is nearest to you. When it seems as though the giant is going to overtake you, that's when Jesus steps in. And whatever he has to do to take care of that giant, he will do it. We just have to have faith to believe and trust that he'll take care of the matter. I'm so grateful that my Christ has gotten the victory over every giant. Adam, the father of the human race, wasn't able to do it. Abraham, the father of the faithful, wasn't able to do it. Moses, the meekest man to ever live, wasn't able to do it. Joshua, Gideon, mighty men of battle, weren't able to do it. Jeremiah, Isaiah, mighty prophets, weren't able to do it. Job, with all of his patience, wasn't able to do it. Solomon, with all of his wisdom, wasn't able to do it. David, a man after God's own heart, wasn't able to do it. John the Baptist, mighty voice in the wilderness, wasn't able to do it. Mary, with her alabaster box of ointment, wasn't able to do it. Peter, 
powerful preacher of Pentecost wasn't able to do it. But Jesus did. He got the victory over every giant. And through his blood, through his grace, he offers that victory to you and to me. And this evening, I want to claim that blood. This evening, I want to claim that grace. How about you? When you go back home, brothers and sisters, the giants are going to be waiting for you. They may give you somewhat of a break (laughs) during camp meeting, but even here, they will attack you. But more so when you go back to Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, E-Course, wherever. They are just waiting to slay you spiritually, mentally, emotionally. But I believe that by God's grace, if he could take care of Goliath, if he could take care of Satan, he can take care of any giant in your life. Because our light afflictions are nothing compared to what our Savior had to go through. And this evening, I want to claim his victory in my life. Is that your prayer? Then if that is your prayer, would you stand with me at this time? Our loving Father in heaven, we pause and we give thanksgiving to you. We recognize, Lord, that we serve a mighty God, one who is able to give us victory in every aspect of life. Lord, we all have our, our, our personal giants that, that are battling us. Some of them are just like demons, and they're seeking to destroy us, but by your grace, During this encampment, we call upon the name of Jesus to deliver us. Lord, we pray for our children that if the giants are, are doing harm to them, help them to call upon Jesus that he might deliver them as well. We claim your power this night. Lord, we're not all that we should be. We're not even deserving to call upon your name, but you said through the blood, through the grace of Jesus, for us to come boldly to the throne, and that's what we're doing this evening. Not in our own merits, but in the power of our Savior. Lord, bless us and keep us. All that we say and do this weekend and this entire week of encampment, give us what we stand in need of because the battle is the Lord's, and we claim it tonight. Bless us and keep us to this end. Give us not only rest tonight, but give us a blessing as the Sabbath hours shall soon be upon us. Keep us as the apple of your eye and save us in your eternal kingdom is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen.